Yeah, ladies and gentlemen and everyone in between, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are around the world. Thank you for joining us today in this event held by Outright Action International. I'm Nazia Saeed, the Arabic Media Project Officer. I host today John Grayson, filmmaker, director from Toronto in Canada since uh, 19... 84. Uh, he has many short transmedia features and he works on explore. Um, uh, no, works have been explored, such queer activist issues as police violence, prison, AIDS activism, solidarity, homo nationalism, and apartheid, both South African and Israeli. These include International Down Chorus Day, which we will watch today, Murder in Passing, Fig Trees, Lilies, Zero Patients, and much more. Grayson is also an active member on a different level in so many countries. We will talk to him and get to know more about him and his work after watching the movie. We choose to screen today uh, International Down Chorus Day, uh, produced last year, was shown in Sura Film Festival in Berlin last year. It's a short movie where birds from six continents join a Zoom call. They gossip about storms and cats and wires and dates. Also, they talked about political prisoners in Egypt. One of them is our beloved Sarah Higazi, the feminist queer activist. We will watch the movie now and we're gonna talk to John later. So please join us. Thank you, John, for being with us today and uh, for, for this great job that uh, Paul just show all the emotions to, um, to congratulate you on this movie. I will start with a question. Um, about the idea behind this movie and how, how do you get to the idea? I mean, you are combining many things coming together. Um, yeah, how, does, how did it come? It, did, it came with the morning paper. Um, on just the day before May 1st, I read two stories and, or really it was online, uh, but one was about International Don Chorus Day. And I was like, so, intrigued like who knew there was an international Don Chorus day and it was the next day and then the other story was about the death of Shadi Habash small small item um, and it really resonated for me because in 2013 I was locked up in the same prison and knew well the conditions he, he'd been experiencing and so it really his story really caught my caught my heart and my imagination um, I, I made a, a, a sort of call. I was intrigued by this Don Chorus idea and we're all suffering in lockdown. This is May 1st, 2020. So I, I threw out a call to friends around the world and said, stick your iPhone out the window and record your Don Chorus. And I thought it could be a, a simple thing. I'll just collect them all and then we'll see what happens. And so 40 people responded, which was pretty good for 24 hour notice. And um, the, uh, the, the, my editor and I started to piece our story together. We knew it was gonna be something about Shadi, something about the birds. And then a month later, uh, Sara took her life. And Sara was someone I'd gotten to know a tiny bit. We, I was part of the group here in Toronto bringing her here to as a refugee after her experience of being arrested and incarcerated in Egypt simply for flying a rainbow flag at a Mashu Leila concert. And Sara had come to Toronto as a refugee, not knowing anyone. Um, really, it was it's tough for anybody, but especially given the trauma she'd been through. But she caught everyone's hearts and she, she her warmth, her smile, she was such a memorable person in our community. And we all felt, you know, she's, she's on, on track. She's getting involved in activism. She's 
living living a life of freedom, uh, some some sort of freedom. Um, but in the end, it was too much for her. Um, and the heartbreak of of her death became part of this story as well. It just had to be. So the Don Course really, it's pieces, little little pieces coming out of my life under lockdown here in Toronto, but very internationally as well, thinking about everybody recording, sharing a Don Chorus, wherever they are, wherever we are, and um, using it as an opportunity to think about everybody still locked up in, in uh, Egypt. Well, that leads us to next question, where to you partially um, answered my next question is like why Egyptian prisoners and you said you were at the same prison that Shadi was in. Shadi just for the people who just join us uh, Shadi was um, he is a director um, and he he was involved in directing music uh, video clip and this video clip was not going with the policies of uh, the leader of Egypt at the moment. That's why he got locked in a prison for more than two years till actually he died in, in 2020 in, in prison. And he was part of the short movie that John um, produced. So why e Egyptian prisoners? It was in 2013, uh, in August, I was on my way to Gaza. I was going to make a film with Dr. Tarek Lubani, who's a dear friend, and we were going to make a film together about his his work in Gaza, working in emergency, uh, life on the ground um, in that time of 2013, life under siege. And so we weren't thinking about Egypt at all, except as a route to get in, because we couldn't go in through Israel, both of us are banned. Um, and so because of our activist work. And so going in through, through Egypt was the only option. And the, um, we didn't realize, but while we were in the air flying to Cairo, um, the, the uh, Rabaskor massacre happened and a thousand people were killed. It's one of the most notorious massacres in Egyptian history, indeed in, in world history. Um, and so we arrived to a country under curfew and of course couldn't get to Gaza. Um, and so the next day went out to witness the, demonstra the peace demonstrations, the, the unarmed peaceful demonstrations that were happening protesting the massacre and ended up being swept up along with um, hundreds of others in the roundup that day. Um, and so I, we ended up, we thought, oh, we're Canadians. We have our Canadian passports. We'll be out in a couple of days. 50 days later, we finally were released. But of course, even that's nothing compared to people we were locked up with who became quite close friends of ours who are still locked up to this day. Mm -hmm. And uh, that brought to you, um, brought the subject close, closer to your heart for sure, but also I think Sara and uh, Shadi's uh, uh, death, uh, like the combination of everything together. Well, the, 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 nobody should die in prison and nobody should die because of prison. And the, the, these two, the loss of these two incredibly beautiful artists and activists um, who should be in our lives today, just, uh, I wanted to make a film which both protested, but also uh, paid tribute to their legacy and tried to shine a light on uh, the beauty they brought into the world, but equally um, the unfairness of their deaths. Well, a lot of details in the movie, very specific from Egyptian and Arab context, but you managed to have it there. I know you have connection to the, to the region, but there were too much details, like the name of the song, who's singing it, um, this kind of who said Bella first. Where do you get it from? It's a, it's all from colleagues and comrades and fellow artists. Mostly, um, mostly I was working closely with Egyptians in particular, Egyptian artists in particular. Some some of whom are here in Canada and some are international, um, but also 
Palestinian artists who are part of our community here, everyone was weighing in. And because of lockdown, maybe people have a bit more time to look at another edit. And we went through many edits. It was a hard story to find the right length. And at one point there was a 20 minute version which had a lot more details and people were going, it's too much. <laughs> get, back to the, get back to the focus on Sour and Shadi. Um, so yeah, but we've, we've, we found our way working completely online and then also sharing it with the 40 filmmakers around the world who contributed and they, they gave us feedback too. Where did the movie uh, screened other than Berlin? It's, a, it's since screened uh, since Berlin at Hot Docs Festival, other documentary festivals, other queer film festivals around the world. Um, and we're really delighted to be able to share it in, with these different audiences around the world. And people, it is remarkable how many people do know Sara's story, how her story did become this global phenomena that, that grows, that keeps growing. Um, Shadi's story less well known, but um, it, it in both cases, um, really delighted to be part of this conversation about Sara's legacy and what Sara and Shadi meant for us. Yeah, I, I can't imagine because I didn't know Sara personally as well, but the, the effect of Sara's death on, on me, on the community was, was very, very strong. And that's why uh, we also searched and we we got to know more about her life actually after her yeah. death. And yeah. as, as you said, yeah, she become an icon for the community, for the struggle, for the fight, for the LGBT community, for the queer community, for the freedom of women and their choices as a feminist activist uh, from the queer uh, community. Also, we know that uh, you are involved in a queer cinema for Palestine project. Can you please tell us what's your role and why Palestine and what's the aim of the whole um, project? I've been involved in solidarity with Palestine since 2005, when I first signed the boycott declaration. And um, then various actions tied to uh, specific festivals. There was a big boycott of TIFF, Toronto International Film Festival in 2009, and I withdrew my film and 3000 of us led a protest, a peaceful and um, non-disruptive non protest, trying to encourage dialogue. Um, I was also part of an action withdrawing my film from Tel Aviv Film Festival, Tel Aviv Gay Film Festival. Um, which is called TLV Fest. Um, and I've been part of that activism ever since. And this past year, we've been doing actions encouraging other people to boycott TLV Fest, um, to withdraw their films. And this year we thought, well, we're, we're asking people to withdraw films, but artists don't like withdrawing. We like to create, we like to share, we like to make our work available but we don't want to, we don't want to, we want to honor the Palestinian boycott. And so we created Queer Cinema for Palestine, which was at the same time as TLV Fest, encouraging filmmakers to pull out of TLV Fest and then join our festival as a counter, a global counter festival. So over, over the course of 10 days, 13 cities presented programs curated completely on the completely autonomously. So every city, every, every group figured out what they wanted to say and how they wanted to contribute. And they defined the theme of queer cinema for Palestine in their own wonderful ways, especially finding intersections with indigenous struggles, with Black Lives Matter, with global anti-apartheid struggles. So it was one of the most exciting festivals I'd ever been part of and very global. Um, six continents over 10 days. So we, um, the, the, the excitement of that, we're, we're still recovering, but we're starting to plan for a second festival this coming year. Yeah, that, that's, that will be one of my questions about the coming plans, but I wanna go back to the intersectionality between um, 
politi political acts and uh, activism and uh, and the queer activism that comes across the art that you are also creating and encouraging other artists to do. Tell us more about it. Well, the mandate of the festival uh, was to embrace the theme of queer cinema for Palestine, but define it as broadly as possible, because that can mean different things for different people in different centers. However, the, the crucial mandate for each event was center Palestinian voices in some way or another, whether it's Palestinian filmmakers or Palestinian activists or speakers. Addressing intersectionality, maybe I'll quote Omar Barghouti, who's the founder of PACB, which is Palestine Academic and Cultural Boycott of Israel. Um, when he spoke at the, at the opening event and in his welcoming remarks, he said, there's people ask, why do, uh, why don't we wait till after the revolution for integrating other issues like queer issues, et cetera? And his answer is, and Pakbi's answer is, um, you know, Palestinian civil society has arrived at an analysis where there's no, uh, there's no waiting. There's no revolution without queer struggles. There's no revolution without feminist struggles. These are completely interconnected issues. And so they're, they're, we work on these now, and that's what's going to make the, that's what's going to lead to success and to a free Palestine. Um, what do you, like, there is always this kind of, of um, um, discussion, the separation between uh, political act and, and LGBT or rights act, and especially the rights of women, and then uh, art as well. Art shouldn't be, uh, of course, not in my opinion, uh, political, it should be entertaining and all of this. So what, what do you, like, how do you um, answer these uh, calls? I think the, the, um, the crucial thing is looking at, and, and I encourage people go online and, and Google Queer Cinema for Palestine, and you'll find documentation from our festival. And you'll see the riches, you'll see how people interpreted their events in very different ways. There was an Albanian event conducted entirely in Albanian. And so it was very much a local audience. What does Palestine mean for us locally? And that wasn't, that actually wasn't webcast to the world. It was just for a local Albanian audience, people in the room. And then there were events which were only, only webcast. And so there was, um, a project I was involved in uh, helping to coordinate, which was Jewish activists speaking out against the weaponization of anti-Semitism. As we all know, one of the key strategies of a Zionist movement is to accuse anyone who speaks out on behalf of Palestine of being anti-Semitic. And so this was Jewish activists like Judith Butler and artists like Leo Shemriz um, and El Flanders Speaking out on uh, speaking out against this weaponization of um, anti-Semitism and saying, "I'm speaking as a Jew in solidarity with Palestine, in, with Palestine, not in my name." And I think the 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 core thing for me about boycott, which I've now been involved in for 15 years, has been that boycott sometimes suggests to people, "Oh, it's about silencing, it's about censoring, it's about saying no." And in my experience especially working with PACB, it's been just the opposite. It's been about building dialogue. It's been about uh, creating opportunities for having discussions like this discussion today about building solidarity across lines of, uh, lines of nation, of language, um, and of experience. And sometimes the conversations are difficult, but it's the focus of, boyc of this boycott movement is about dialogue. I'm curious myself to know like what brought um, an artist director from Canada to be an activist uh, against Zionism in Israel. It's, it goes back to South Africa. And I was, I was active in the mid eighties uh, in the anti-apartheid movement. And we were part of a queer group, the Simon Nakodi Anti-Apartheid Committee doing solidarity with, with anti-apartheid work at that time. Flash forward 15 years later, I made a film 
called Fig Trees, which was about the South African movement and about the struggle around AIDS treatments in South Africa. And it featured anti-apartheid activists like Zaki Ahmed. And TLV Fest invited it to be part of the festival. And I look at this groovy, hip anarchist festival in Tel Aviv, and they say nice things on their website about we support Palestinian rights, and we believe let's all hold hands and sing Kumbaya. And the, 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 and I thought, oh, this, this is okay. This must be okay. I support boycott, but this, obviously this festival won't be a target of boycott. But then I spoke to Pakby and Pakby said, no, this is a, a textbook example of pinkwashing. This is the Israeli state supporting a gay festival, a cool, groovy anarchist gay festival um, as a way of hiding the sins of apartheid. And this, this is exactly why Pakbi is calling out whether it's greenwashing, whether, when you use the environment to hide apartheid or pinkwashing using, using gay rights to hide apartheid. This is a textbook example. And so I wrote to the festival and said, no, I have to withdraw after, if, if, you, can't, if you can't take a stronger stand against the apartheid regime, I've got to withdraw. And at the center of it was, I can't show a film that's about apartheid in South Africa in a festival that is implicitly supporting apartheid. Nothing, that contradiction, I couldn't, I couldn't look in the mirror and face myself. And, and I think that the second part of the answer is our local community of queer activism, which I've, I've been part of. And most of my work comes out of the activist work I do, um, whether it's fighting the police locally or fighting, uh, fighting um, our, uh, our I, I was involved in a group protesting or, or critiquing um, gay marriage um, and the, the problems with the commodification of gay marriage, et cetera, or uh, AIDS activism in particular. Everything about it was local and it was really the inspiration of local activists who were working with queers, uh, a, a group called Queers Against Israeli Apartheid and joining them and becoming very hands-on involved with them led to um, the, that activism. And now, uh, you know, as I said, my focus was on, of course, on, on Palestine, but now I'm also focused on Egypt and continue to do uh, a lot of work protesting the ongoing human rights abuses of the dictatorship in Egypt and, and especially speaking out for prisoners. Thank you, John. Um, I would end our like my talk with you because we're gonna also open to the audience about the coming plans. Like, do you have uh, more more films in the pipeline, more festivals? The 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 big film I'm working on today, in fact, we're trying to lock picture next week, is a feature about BDS, a feature about boycott, divestment, sanction. And it's summing up all this work from 15 years, particularly the Toronto Solidarity. So again, a local focus, uh, but um, working with uh, activists like Hadir Shafi in who's in uh, Palestine um, leading with uh, their festival, uh, which is uh, working with the Eswat group um, and their Kuz festival, their Kuz queer festival. So, um, it's it's trying to capture in an in an inventive way in an imaginative way some of the activism some of the amazing queer activism of the past 10 15 years uh yeah, again supporting boycott yeah just for for the record for the audience who doesn't know uh, radir is a very well known activist in palestine a uh, queer activist and a swat group is an lgbt rights group also in palestine um, I will open the floor for questions from the audience. If you have any, please post it in the chat or raise your hand and we can, um, um, the function of sound being activated if you want to share your question or comment uh, in a
Okay, I can see that there is um, a comment by Alexander in the, in the chat. I think it's for you, um, John, if you, if you can reach that or so that. It's I, Alexander, thanks for picking up on that particular visual of the parks and the birds in the parks. Um, one of the things uh, that I remember vividly was we, we were all, when we were in prison, um, we were, we just had a, a very thin line of windows uh, at the top of the cell and we could look out and see nothing but sky. We couldn't, we, we, it, was, it was way too high to see any other buildings or anything. But every now and then, like a bird would fly through. And so you could wait 10 minutes and finally you'd see a bird and it would be a split second. But there was that ritual every morning of lying awake. There's imagine 36 of us lying on the concrete and, it, and it's a small space. It's just three meters by 10 meters. Um, so 36, 36 men trying to sleep, but the dawn light is coming in and every now and then a bird will a tiny, a tiny flash of a bird. So um, it was for all the parks we couldn't see. <laughs> if there is no more questions than or comments by or any of the attendees, we can actually end this talk today. Yeah, I can. I can't see any. Thank you, John, for these insights, for talking with us today. It's, uh, really honored and delighted to share the film and be part of this conversation. So thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you everybody for joining us today in this event held by Outright Action International. I'm Nazia Saeed again, and I hope to see you soon.